Hello and a very warm welcome back to Widowed AF. You're here with Rosie Gill Moss. And joining me today, I'm going to do my very best job of pronouncing your name, Ksenia. How did I do? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, had some pra- <laughs> we, we did practice before we came on mic. So, Ksenia, you're joining me from Barcelona in Spain. So, thank you. I love to know that we're kind of reaching out a little bit further than the UK here. And you're you you're going to talk about your your you described her as your beautiful husband and in your application I don't know there's a couple of things you know about how precious the time you had with him was and even just reading it I can feel that there was an awful lot of love between you so I'm I'm really I don't want to say I'm really looking forward to hearing your story because that sounds a little bit morbid but I'm looking forward to talking to you um and you are the widow of a a man doing a, a stupid hobby as well aren't you (laughs) <laughs> yes, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Mm, I'm quite nervous and already I'm teary eyed. And I must oh. say, I admire all the women who have courageously shared their story and helped me. Because, yes, after my husband died doing paragliding, one of the first things that I uh, looked for was more people who were in this situation. And as I couldn't read for a very long while, listening to what interesting became, yeah, um, a really good resource for me. So I felt less isolated, less alone, less like the universe conspired against me to make me the unhappiest person in the world. Oh, do you know what? This could be my feelings being spoken out loud because I felt exactly the same. And not that I'm diminishing people who lose somebody to a terminal illness, but there are generally more people who can, who've experienced that loss. And when it's very sudden, um, it is extraordinarily jarring. And I sort of jokingly said, oh, he was doing a, you know, a ridiculous hobby. But actually, I should, probably shouldn't downplay that because I, there was a, my, Ben's death got picked up by the national press and I stupidly went onto the comments only once. And of course, oh, what was he doing diving when he's got a family? And of course, there are risks in everything we do. Every time we get behind the wheel of a car, every time we get in a plane. And whilst I would prefer him not to have gone into the water that day, I don't begrudge him the joy that scuba diving brought him for the years in which he did it. But these they are called high-risk sports for a reason. And unfortunately, I have spoken to several people who've lost their spouse doing one of these high-risk activities but nobody ever thinks it will happen to them so we know personally that it it can and it does so I think that by telling your story you're going to be uh, you're going to now help other people which is so important because it it makes you feel better it makes you feel that some good has come from this um and I'm really grateful that you found support from us because that's that's kind of the whole point of it right correct (laughs) And you know what what is so funny, Rosie, um, um, I will have to digress a bit because my father died when I was nine and uh, my mom was only 30 and um, I saw her in her grief. I sort of, I think I now realized after doing therapy again, you know, uh, again, I mean, after Andrea died. And I thought I sort of processed and dealt with grief, dealt with grief of my losing my father. But in fact, I realized that there was a lot of unprocessed feelings because I, even in my happiest moments and people saw me as the sunshine and and, and, and joyous and so on, but I always had this need or this feeling that I needed to control myself or control the circumstances or control life. And the funny thing is with Andre, I felt so safe all the time and he was so secure and so confident and he loved me in such a way that made me feel so like safe. Safe. I never, whenever he did the paragliding and the fact he he didn't do that so often, I'll explain also the circumstances a bit later. Uh, I never thought of it as a high-risk sport. For example, I was more worried when he was in a car, you know, because he had to drive a lot for his work. I was more worried then than when he went paragliding because, uh, I don't know. And on the day he died, 
my mom called me and he said like and she said like where is Andre? And I said, oh, you know, he's, he went paragliding. And, and she was like, oh, no. Oh, my God. That's so dangerous. And I was like, Mom, come on. Stop being so negative all the time. And I didn't know. But at the time when we spoke, he was already dead. He already yeah. died in a paragliding accident. So, you know. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry, Ksenia. I'm really am because uh, and also this has made me go quite goosebumpy because um. Ditto, right? I when the police knocked at my door, I still thought he must have had a car accident. Yeah, I knew he'd gone scuba diving, and Ben drove. Um, he had a business base out in France, so he would drive um, to France and back, and he would be quite tired when he was driving. And I used to worry desperately, and particularly when there was all the rioting in Calais and they were sort of throwing bricks. At, and you know, I was really genuinely quite scared for him. But much like you, I mean, I'm I, I'm a qualified scuba diver. I haven't since I had the kids. Um, probably won't again but much like you it never really crossed my mind that it was a, a high risk sport and he also much like it sounds like Andre was was he was this um fit young we actually used to jokingly call him Mr Health and Safety because he was so careful with his kit and so methodical and it's, to be honest it's the main reason I didn't do it was because I I just the calculations of debt but, oh, no, not for me but <laughs> yeah it's it, and actually I stood in I don't know whether you may have heard this on a previous episode but I stood in the playground on the day that he died chatting to the mothers as you do and we were talking about I think boringly electricity bills that sort of thing and I said oh if Ben dropped dead tomorrow I'd have no idea who we to pay the electric to so much like you you're saying these things and they're already dead and it's like how did I not know it's really weird I'm so sorry that yeah. you went through that too but almost as a a, a a solace in knowing that we've been through it both been through it right yeah yeah I tell you what can I get you then why don't you take me back um start wherever you like if you want to tell me about your relationship because you were only married what was it three months before he died as well so you're newlyweds which is it's just kind of another another just another thing to smack you in the face with really isn't it so Tell, yeah. Start wherever you would like to, my lovely, and and tell me a little bit about the man that he was and and the relationship you had, and then and then when you're ready to take me back to that day. Okay, thank you. So I met Andre a month after I turned forty-one, um, and uh, by that point, I already felt like I would never meet the man who could, you know live up to my expectations <laughs> I had some really mm, not not nice experiences let's say and the the long-term relationship I had before that was quite a toxic one and it took me a while to you know find myself get my self-confidence back and so on so I was at a good at a good point when I when I met Andre and I met him at a friend's birthday party. I'm so sorry, I've got to interrupt you because the smile on your face as you're talking about meeting him is absolutely, it's breaking my heart, but it's also melting my heart because the, your face has just lit up into the most beautiful smile as you talk about meeting him. I, I just want, I had to mention it as you were. I'll try not to interrupt again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, and it was a funny story because I almost didn't go to that birthday party because... At that point, I wasn't that close to, to the friend and I had already made plans, but then she really insisted. And uh, to tell you the truth, she already tried to set me up with somebody after she heard that I was single. And I was sort of like worried that she would try that again at her at that party. But then I went there. It was great. It was intimate. There were very few of us. And then I never suspected anything. But in fact... Uh, she did invite Andre on purpose and she wanted the two of us to meet because she knew that somehow she knew that we would be perfect for each other. And we just talked for a while. But then, as I said, I had made plans before. So I was going out with a friend. We were going out dancing <laughs> that night. So I left quite early. But uh, the conversation I had with Andre, he made me feel so calm and so natural as if I had known him, you know, for forever. And uh, 
I don't know how he just managed to get my phone number, but in a really like just natural and subtle way. It didn't feel like, oh, I'm asking for your number because, you know, I'm interested in you in that way, you know? It was just, I don't know. And then we talked every day for a week because a week after that party, this group of friends organized a barbecue just so we could spend more time together. So, <laughs> so your friends have so facilitated this. <laughs> And it was at, at his house. And also, I almost didn't go because he had a dog and I was afraid of big dogs. And I was like, no, let's meet somewhere else on another occasion. Doesn't matter. But, you know, <laughs> I did go. How was the dog? Uh, well, he finally put him uh, sort of aside. But by the end of the evening, the dog was with us and the dog was very friendly Um of course, I mean, like owner, like dog. <laughs> You've seen my dog, right? Look, look um, like Yeah, and you know what? I ended up staying three days at his house <laughs> because all, he lived in like a, a, a small town with no like access by public transport. And all our friends, when we when they saw we were getting along so well, sort of started leaving. And then a friend who took me there, she just said, we are leaving you in good hands and just left. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Your friends really wanted this relationship to happen, didn't they? They did. And what can I say? It was like everything I ever wanted, everything I thought that I, it, it can only exist in my imagination because at some point, you know, you think like, okay, Maybe I'm just imagining how things should be and, and it doesn't really exist, but it did, it does. And Andre, he was, and it pains me to say he was, because he was the person with, I don't know, the incredible amount of energy, like the most alive person who lived life so fully and he was so generous and so loving and so kind. And he had this great big laugh. He was tall and, 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 and quite skinny, <laughs> but you know, fit, but he ate all the time. It sounds like, this sounds like somebody I, I know as well, actually. Yes. Yeah. Not fair, is it? Yeah. We would, we would, for example, we would have breakfast. We would leave the house, do something. And I was, and I was like, looking at him, are you hungry? And he would always say, always. <laughs> It's like they burn this kind of metabolism just burns whatever they put onto the fire yeah Ben was the same he was pretty he was just always on on the go on the go and and he would just eat like an entire baguette and then want pudding afterwards like <laughs> <laughs> yeah like they, they they were really eating life you know and, and um so and I was so amazed by him because he was so different from anyone else I knew and so different. He, he was from Brazil, I must say, as well. I don't, uh, so like two completely different cultures, you know. Because you're not the, from Spain, are you? You are a, a, no. originally from Slovakia, is that right? You're Slovakia? Slovenia. Slovenia, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> don't want to say that again. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you, but you, how long have you been in Barcelona? Oh, um, it's 14 years okay. now for myself and Andre was, uh, came to Barcelona before me, before I did. So we, we, we both had been living in Barcelona for a while before we met. And actually when we met, we were like, oh, why did it took us so long to meet? But you know, he was in a relationship before, he was actually married before. And I was in a relationship. So if we had met at any other point, we probably wouldn't have ended up together. And then, of course, because I was 41, he was 38 or 39 when we met. Like, we talked about everything from the beginning very openly. And we soon discussed the topic of kids as well, because it was like, you know, I was 41. Tick, tick, so tick. if we were going to have kids, we were going to have to start working on it immediately but we said you know like um it's very difficult to have children with none of our families nearby 
Um, also, we said, um, let's see, we were not saying we won't have kids, but we said we decided not to try. To see what happened. Uh, you know, on purpose, but if it happened. Go with the flow. It did. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and time, time was always so precious. And from the beginning, we said, like, okay, um, let's say, let's not say we'll be together forever, but well, let's say for about 120 years. Cute. That's cute. <laughs> it was our joke. So, on the first anniversary, we said, only 119 years left to go, you know. This is very cute. So, so now. And, he is the person who taught me how to say I love you without being scared of being rejected or being hurt. And he said it to me every single day. It took me a while to say it back to him. And when I did, he was so happy. <laughs> um, but it does sometimes take somebody quite special, particularly if you've been hurt in the past. And those three words... and. It's, I often say to the kids, saying I love you is easy. I could go up to a stranger and say, I love you. But it doesn't mean I mean it. And when you mean it and you're scared that it might not be reciprocated or that your heart might get trampled upon or hurt, those three words suddenly take on an enormous amount of power. And they're really, really, you know, when they're used with love, they're very powerful, aren't they? That's true. That's so true. And I think that since Andrea became a part of our family, I'm referring to my mom, to my sister and uh, my nieces, uh, we started saying I love you to one another more often. And the first time I, I, I took Andrea to Slovenia to meet my family, it was a surprise. <laughs> like We flew <laughs> in for my mom's birthday. <laughs> So all my mom's, my mom's sisters and their families and everybody was there at my mom's place and, and we rang the doorbell <laughs> and we opened the door and my mom was like in shock and then Andre just opened his arms like this and he said, mom, and hugged her. <laughs> it was so beautiful. What a man though, because that's a baptism of fire, isn't it? Different country, mother-in-law. And does your mom speak English? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the language of love then, open arms, right? The language of love. And he was so amazing. He he learned how to speak, you know, like basic Slovene. So he always asked my mother how I, when we were talking on on uh, on on the phone, you know, that, like these video calls and so on, he would always say like in Slovenian and ask her how she was. Can and, you say it in know, Slovenian so. for me? Kakosti. And I bet she loved that. I bet she loved that he'd made that the little bit of effort to learn her language. I think oh, yeah. things like this tell you quite a lot about the person as well. She loved him so much. We, I mean, we all, we all did and we all do. We yeah. all do. I know it's, it's a mixed blessing sometimes when they are so loved because like you, my mum and dad adored Ben as, you know, they thought of him almost as a son and, having to break the news to them was almost as difficult as having to break the news to his mum because you you spend, you, you know, you become part of the family. You, you it's, it's, there's a, a country song and it's, uh, it's called like more hearts than mine. And it's actually about breaking up, but it's the idea that if you break up, you, it's not just my heart that you'll break. And of course it isn't, is it? It's all the people that love them through you. And yeah, it's, it's the, it's the, the, the tragedy that keeps giving is really, isn't it? So let's let me let's let's talk a little bit about um, the paragliding. So paragliding is where you launch yourself off of a hill, do you? Or is it, are we talking behind a boat? We're talking launching off of. So talk, talk to me a off little. Off a hill, hmm. yeah. Off a mountain, correct. So yeah. So how was this something um, that he did regularly? Was it a hobby of his? And and my kind of adjacent question would be did you do it as well uh so he started doing that in brazil already mm -hmm. before he came to barcelona and when i met him uh, um, a couple of months after that he he went paragliding and i was like wow you know my 
I'm afraid of heights, so... <laughs> that probably answers my, my adjacent question then, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but he didn't uh, do it so, so often. He went a couple of times in the first couple of years, and then there was the lockdown. Of so, course. And then a couple of times he went, but the weather conditions were not good. So he didn't do it that often, but, you know, it was a, a passion of his. But he loved nature. He loved um, climbing. He loved hiking. He just really enjoyed being in nature. And I myself, I'm more of a, like, the beach girl. So with me, he sort of acquired a taste for, for the sea as well. And he, he, he loved swimming as well and... Just after the wedding, we bought like this stand-up paddle surf and, and he loved doing that. Unfortunately, he didn't get a chance to do it many times. But yeah, he, he, he just and he was so good at everything that he tried. So and then so I'll explain all of the circumstances, why he's why I think he sort of started doing the paragliding again so often and basically we got married in, in June 2022 and at my wedding at our wedding basically my mom told me at one point that um, they found a tumor in her kidney and she was looking at me at the wedding. We were, I was dancing with my mother, I remember. And she was looking at everybody, you know, so much joy. Our wedding was beautiful. All our friends and so much love. And she said, I do still want to be here for a while. And I was like, of course, you will be, you know. But at that point, we didn't know what it was. And then, and then, <clears throat> oh yeah, one week after the wedding, the next weekend, Andre and I went to this place where he does the paragliding because he said now after the, the wedding all this stress and la la I need to relax you know so there's a beautiful camping space, uh, spot and a swimming pool but and that at that time I met all his paragliding buddies friends let's say and the instructor and so on and we did talk about the possibility of me doing a tandem uh, <laughs> thing and I said no no way and plus they were saying like oh you remember the this guy's wife when she went paragliding and how she vomited and I was like oh yeah you're just making this more and more effective for me <laughs> yeah, please sign me up right now <laughs> exactly but the weather was so hot there was no wind and it was actually because of the risk of fire it was prohibited to go uh, uh, to the mountain so not, he didn't do the paragliding. He was just practicing, you know, like the takeoff and landing and stuff like that. So I didn't see him, see him do it. And then <clears throat> soon after that, I remember I was with a friend um, at the beach. And I was at work, I think. And I received a call from my mom. It was at the end of June, I think. So just a couple of weeks after the wedding. And she said, you know... It's cancer, and they will have to remove my kidney. So I started organizing myself to go to, 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 to be with her. Mm. I asked for unpaid leave at work, which they didn't approve. And then I got the permission to work from abroad. So I had to take all the, the computer and everything. And I was working from my mom's place. I mean, my sister was there, but she has twins and I just wanted to be there for my mom as well. And um, so I was there for a month, basically, after her surgery and Andre was at home, <laughs> we, uh, alone with the three animals that he had, uh, you know, I, I already mentioned the dog, but he he had two cats as well. So, of course, we move, when we moved in together, they came with us and so on. So, of course, he was working. He had to take care of all the animals, of course, and he was also worried. But he was always so positive. He would always just tell me, everything is going to be all right. Don't worry. Don't worry. So every day we talked, it would be like, everything is going to be all right. And I was like, how do you know? How do you know that things are going to be all right? You know, I wasn't feeling very positive, but also I was 
positive for my mom, but when I was talking with him, yes, then of course. of course it was my moment too. So he was the to person that I was basically. And he was sort of the person uh, that was offering and... you the support while you're caring for your mum. That you everybody needs somewhere where they can do that kind of ugly crying and despair. Because you can't do that to your mum because you're trying to keep her positive. I I get that. I really get that. And when you lose your partner, your your husband, your, your whoever your 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 romantic partner is, you you lose that. That you lose that person that you can be completely and I a bit of a icky word, but authentic with. You know. And I I I can again. I'm not trying to make this about me, but I can really relate to just this person on the end of the phone that was always there. And then and I. Sorry, I've I've gone off. On, I've gone on a tangent now, but I, I can't help but noticing the fact that you only had three months after you were married, and for a month of that, you were abroad, and that must be quite painful. It must be, and you were absolutely doing the right thing. You were with your mother who needed you, but that's time that you've the time that you say it, it's very precious. That time now, exactly, mm. exactly. So at the weekends, he he went to this. Um, a mountain. He spent the weekends. He took the dog and he he camped there and he was doing paragliding. He was sending me videos and you know he was just really happy. And that was his way to you know like de-stress. relax and um, de stress, I guess you know. Uh, so apart from the fact that I was away for a, for a whole month, I sort of, I mean, guilt is a, a really horrible part of grief. And, and 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 remorse and regret. So I sort of thought, oh my God, if I hadn't gone to Slovenia, he wouldn't have been doing that. No, that's we true. would have been doing other things. So he wouldn't get so you know addicted to it. Oh, no, uh, I, again, I know. And and we blame ourselves for everything, right? You know, I I I sort of encouraged men to go back to it. We'd not long had our daughter, our youngest child. She was six months and I was like, it's fine now. You know, I can cope with the kids. You you go, you do the thing you love because you don't want to stop anybody doing the thing they love. And it, it's hindsight's a funny old thing. And I, A, he was a grown man and I couldn't have stopped him. You know, that would have been coercive control, right? He's allowed to do, he was allowed to do what he wanted. But also you don't want to deny somebody doing something they love, but I can't alleviate the guilt from you. I can't, uh, but I can tell you, widow to widow, woman to woman, that you don't need to feel guilty for being with your mum. Like you did the right thing, and men will do what they will do, and people will do what they will do. Um, and if it not hadn't been paragliding, it, it might have been something. You know, you could have crossed the road at the wrong time. This is the what ifs. We will never know. We'll never know. Yeah, yeah. So. Where was I? Sorry. Yeah. So uh, no, no, don't worry. Thank you for sharing. Uh, that's why we're here for, no? <laughs> you were just telling me about um, being at your mum's and how you were feeling, um, yeah, unnecessary guilt. Yeah. So basically, just after I was supposed to come back to to Barcelona, we uh, found out what kind of cancer it was because typically the kidney tumor because. I'm not even sure if we knew it was cancer or, or a tumor I, because all the time, like leading to the day of Andre's death is a bit of a blur, yeah. including that day, of course, and the days after that. I think you'd remember it in crystal clarity, but you just, some things, yes, but other things, I can't tell you the timeline. I can't tell you what I did that day. Yeah, it's, I, I'm the same. It's, um, it's all like a, just a whirling yeah yeah so we did find out that it was cancer and that she needed chem chemotherapy you know so when i went back to barcelona i also felt guilty because that was just the time when my mom was supposed to start the the treatment and of course the treatment leaves you with you know feeling very weak and so on and so i came back and i was quite worried and i was not my best self you know it was not like i came back to andre and now we can do our honeymoon no because i was worried i was not in a good mood i was tired so yeah that's also like loads of regret oh sweet and uh, so basically after i came back we only had about less than three weeks basically and on one weekend we went to to the mountains where friends were renting like a like a, an old cottage and 
so it was a very lovely weekend. And then the following weekend, we were talking about what we wanted to do. And I said, well, I'm not really sure. I can't really make plans. I'm also fine with just being at home, you know, because just, you know, like have a relaxing weekend. Of course, that was not <laughs> a good enough plan for Andre. No, well, not for the adrenaline junkie. <laughs> So he said, "Well, I'll go to I'll go to I'll I'll go do the paragliding, and if you want to come, we can we can just have like a camping weekend together." And you have no idea how I beat myself up for not joining him, for not going that weekend, of course, because I also thought, you know, if we had done one thing differently, everything else would have been different. And of course, other people say, "Oh no, what if you were there and you had to, you know?" So. Of course, these are things that we will never know. So uh, he left very early in the morning and he even took the dog. I said, you can leave the dog at home. And he said, no, 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 I'll take him so you can relax and you can take your day off and go to the beach or whatever you feel like doing. So I didn't have to take the dog out for a walk, you know. And yeah, that's so funny because I don't remember saying goodbye to him in the morning. I, I must have, and I, I don't remember walking him to the door or not, or whether I just, I just stayed in bed. I can't remember. So when he got there, he sent me a message. Of course, we said to, to each other that we, you know, I love you, I love you, enjoy your day and so on. And then I was just, you know, like I spent the whole day in my pajamas watching This Is Us. Oh, <laughs> Uh, and then I talked to my mom, she called me and it was already quite late in the afternoon. And the last time I heard from him was like around noon when he sent me a photo of, you know, of the place where they take off. And that was it. Honestly, Rosie, I still can't explain it to myself. How come I didn't become nervous or panicky or before? Like... Yeah. Because normally he would send me a message and, uh, you know, we would be in touch. And I knew that even if he bet if his battery went dead, he knew my phone number by heart. I didn't know his. I don't know anybody's number by heart. No, not even my own. <laughs> I knew that he would have called me from another phone or something. But I don't know. Somehow I was not, not worried. But at one point it shifted and I immediately started to feel panicky. So I called a friend, this friend who, who actually uh, uh, set us up, <laughs> the friend of the birthday party. One who started this whole thing. Yeah, and I, and I said to her, oh, you know, I know that I'm the one uh, who always sort of worries about things too much and that I'm panicking. So that's why I'm calling you to tell me what you think. You know, I haven't heard from Andre since noon and it's, I don't know, it was about six o'clock at that point. I'm not really sure even about that. And she said, nah, don't worry. I'm sure she's, he's okay. But, you know, if you don't hear from him for another hour or so, just let me know and we can go and drive up there and, and see and see what's going on. And I was like, OK. And I wanted to, to return to the, you know, sofa and watch TV and stuff. But no, I was just so, so, so nervous. And I said, OK, I better have a at some point I said, I better have a shower and, 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 and put on some clothes if we in the end go and, and have to drive up there because it's, it was like an hour and a half, an hour and a half drive. And I myself, I don't drive. Plus, I took the car anyway. <laughs> so I would have to go with friends. So anyway, I went into the shower and while I was having a shower, The doorbell rang. And I couldn't get out of the bath because I was shaking so much. Because I think at that point I knew that something had happened. Maybe I didn't know that he was dead, but I knew that something bad had happened. So I answered. And they asked, are you this and this person? And I was like, yes. Yeah. And they said, the police, can you let us come up? 
So while they were taking the lift to get to the apartment, I called back this friend and, and I, I don't know what I said, whether I was screaming or crying. And I said, the police are here, the police are here. And she said, we are coming over. They also lived an hour away or so. So I opened the door and these, these two policemen were there. And it was so strange because they didn't want to tell me like that he died. He, they said he had an accident and I screamed so much. And, and I still to this day can't believe that none of the neighbors came out to see what was happening, you know. And, and then they say, said, can we come in? And I was like, no. <laughs> Because that's oh, not real, I right? To, I don't want you to come in and I don't want you to tell me anything else. <laughs> of course, they came in <laughs> and I asked them, is he in, in hospital? And I knew that he wasn't in hospital at that point because probably somebody would have called me and told me come to this hospital, you know? And then this strange thing begins that so many of of the widows I, I I heard explain, you know, like you see yourself like from, it's like an out of body experience. I was listening to my voice, which I didn't recognize. I was saying words that I didn't recognize. I was thinking, this is a movie. This is not my life. You know, this, this cannot be true. This is, so, this is um, the, the parallels are, are really, really uncanny here, you know? Um, even down to the, I was in the bath with the children. Um, I just got out. I was, uh, one of the things I can remember was I didn't have a bra on. I put my pajamas on with a bra. I was I was finished breastfeeding, like I needed a bra. Um, and that, the police knocking at the door and, and that realization that something awful had happened. And like you, I was thinking he's had an accident. He's had an accident. He's crashed the car. They are here to tell me that he's in hospital. Um, but even to the point where, you know, that you were saying I wasn't worried. Why wasn't I worried? Right? Ben left at seven o'clock that morning. The police didn't come till seven o'clock that night. Why wasn't I worried? It's really peculiar. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so strange. So, yeah. And I put on, and, you know, I was in a shower with the purpose of, you know, making myself presentable. But when they rang, I, I had no idea what I did. I just put on my back of my pajamas on, you know, so... Oh my God. And, and, and I think like you said, I was also worried about the way I, I looked. I, then I put something over myself and I said, if they wanted to drink something, yeah. it was really hot. And I said, whether well, they wanted some water or something, of course they didn't want anything. They just wanted my friends to arrive so that they could leave. But <laughs> I had very, two uh, very young police officers and I think they were, probably almost as traumatized by the experience um they said when my friend arrived um because I was holding my daughter and they they said they were just trying to get me to come sit down because they were scared I was going to drop the baby and of course I wouldn't let anybody take the baby no. no my uh but yeah this this idea of watching yourself and I can remember thinking am I behaving correctly because where Ben was missing they searched my house and I was like am I behaving like somebody that's hiding their husband under the bed like it, you just there I don't know, You, you. It, it's such a f peculiar phenomenon, yet to hear somebody describe it exactly as I experienced it is, it's, I mean, it, you, I don't know if you can see, but I, I'm I'm hoping that my waterproof mascara is waterproof, I <laughs> think, because I'm stuck. you've got me leaking from the eyes, but, um, sorry, I've, I, I, it's, yeah, it's, um, it, it's really familiar, and I'm just so sorry that you, you went through this too, um, so, would they tell you what had happened and, or did they want you to wait until your friend got there? It was really weird because I think, and also the reason it took them so long because the, the, the address that was linked to the car insurance, let's say, or a car license was not the same address that we were currently living at because we moved twice or three times. Now I'm so lost. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it had happened that they informed the wrong person. So I think they didn't want to give me all the details and they sort of avoided saying, 
he died because they were, were, you know, but I mean, they were already there. So they should have told me just the, you know. Uh, so, yeah, in the end, they did say that, uh, you know, there was an accident that he, a paragliding accident and that he died. Uh, but they gave me a number of the uh, police station in that area where he was doing the paragliding so and told me you need to go call that number and they will give you more details you know and then these two um i don't know uh, not the doctors but there was a psychologist and like the two people from the ambulance they came and and then my friends finally arrived and yeah I slept at a friend's place. I say slept, but of course I didn't sleep. Uh, and then the following day we went to the place and everything was already set in motion. We had to go. We were there. I was asking people what was what happened. Nobody could tell me exactly what happened. People who were paragliding with, with him that day just said that at one day, like sort of took off together. They saw him in the air a couple of times and then somebody saw that there was like a, a, you know, this paragliding sail, they, they saw it on one of the rocks below. So that's when they realized that Andre was not in the air anymore. And do they know what happened? Do you know what happened? Not, not really, no. No. And you know what's absurd here? I still don't have the... Uh, autopsy results or do you know like all yes. the report yeah yes. and I have a friend who's a lawyer who's helped me with a lot of things thankfully I, I don't think I, I would have been able to do I mean in the end I should I, I, I would have done things but you know like just I was in such a st state of shock and I'm so grateful that I had people who who helped so anyway, uh, he was with me when we went to to the courthouse and to all these things. And they did tell us like the, the autopsy and these, like the report uh, could take about a year, which didn't make sense at all. But now it's almost a year and a half and I didn't get these the, the results of the report. So my friend called, I think two days ago. And they said, no, we still don't have it. It, it. it it can take two years as well, you know. And I'm just wondering how. I mean, he has been dead for a year and a half. I mean, you are not going to do anything new. I mean, he was cremated. I mean, all the things that you have, oh, you cool. have them already. So why is it taking so long? Because... Goodness. I read the police report the other day because I needed some number for the court to be able to ask about that, you know, and 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 I read through it the other day and it completely took me back to that moment and and I know that once I have those results I will have to go through, you know, another I don't know. So I just I find it so so horrible it's inhumane it is what it is it's inhumane years. it's this is this is horrible and as um <laughs> a fellow member of the i don't know what happened to my husband club um i had to go to again another parallel i have a, a lawyer friend who helped me go to the high court to have him legally declared dead which is such a convoluted and it was I was only the second person in this country to use this law so nobody knew what it was and even when I remarried I they asked for the death certificate and I said well I have a presumption of death certificate and they sort of looked well we've never seen one of those before and the unknown the not knowing I think is 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 it's so hard it's so hard I I I have a rough idea of what killed Ben we think that he was probably sick in the water but Mm -hmm. without a body or without somebody having been there you don't know and you how are you supposed to grieve when you don't know what's happened and for you to have to then go be brought back into it again potentially two years later to have to find oh it's just cruel it's so cruel 
It is, it is. Because, of course, I didn't know the details. So I, in the beginning, like in the first couple of months, I just kept imagining what could have happened. Of course, I mean, it could have been a wind, some sort of wind, but there were so many people there. And the day was, like they said, everybody said, perfect conditions. Of course, high-risk sport that I know now, you know, things can happen. But also, you know, I kept imagining stuff and I thought like, you know, because I don't have those results, that maybe won't solve exactly the mystery of what happened exactly. But, you know, it left space for me to imagine, like, but what if he had some sort of heart failure and he died right. before he crashed? That would be such a relief, you know, a relief. I, I mean, it, it's all it's all relative in, in bereavement, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. You know, I mean, I would think maybe it could have happened, then it would have happened to him anyhow, and maybe on the road, and he could have, oh you know. But there's no point in all these stories in my head, because I don't know. But this is so and... weird, because I said the same thing. And I was saying, what if he'd had a heart attack or a brain aneurysm, and he was driving the car? What if he killed some other people? Like, it's you start to kind of rationalize and go, well, that would be better than that. And, but right. We're just, we're, it's guesswork. It's, and um, I just wanted to also, sorry, just to go back a bit, but you, when we talk about it being a high risk sport and I noted that you'd said, you know, he wouldn't go if the conditions were bad. And, and I think what we're looking at is like a calculated risk. I think from the sounds of it, him and Ben, they weren't necessarily what you would call risk takers. They were quite sensible, um, but they did like the adrenaline and the the kind of uh, action man aspect of these sports. And yeah. but it's not like yeah. he was sort of launching himself off a mountain on his own, you know, with no experience. It's it's he's a perfect condition. So, and that does lead you to question: Well, what if something happened? And that's what an autopsy or coroner's report would give you. It well potentially would give you the answers. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. And um, another, I wanted to say something about that, you know, like going back to the day and just imagining what had happened. I I think that a couple of your guests or more than a couple said that EMDR helped them. And it did help me uh, as well. I had a couple of sessions. They are very emotionally draining, but they did sort of stop me from going back and trying to imagine what happened and how it happened. So, I mean, it's not that I never think about that again, but it's different. And it's not that kind of so... all-encompassing, I can't see around this. It's uh, interesting you say, Yemja, because um, I, I have tried it recently. I've had, I had went for one session, but I didn't feel the connection with the practitioner I didn't feel safe. Um, oh. And so I, I listened to my body, actually, which I, I and I left. But where I okay. live, um, in the village that I live, they're just opening up a counselling centre, literally like a three minute walk from my house. And I asked them if they're going to be offering EMDR and they are from April. So I'm, I'm definitely going to revisit it because almost every single person I've spoken to that's tried it has had, yes, it, they say, yes, it's very difficult and it's very painful but it does help you to sort of take those really enormous, scary feelings and sort of almost file them neatly so you can access them if you need to, but they're not right in your face all the time. So I, it, it's interesting to hear you, you say about it because, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I, I'm, I'm open to trying myself. Yeah, I did change therapists as well. Mm. So... Me too. I, I understand completely. I mean, you, you are so vulnerable. There is so much to to uncover and so much for the therapist to hold for you that you really need to feel the connection. Yeah, yeah, you too. And they need to be quite experienced, I think, as well. It's a these are quite heavy stories that we're gonna land on a therapist, right? I, I often um walk into my because I've I've found a really amazing uh, talk therapist and I've been going for nearly three years and I often walk in and this reference may be wasted on you. I don't know if it translates, but I um, I always say to her, have you had your extra Weetabix? Because there was like, oh, I, I, if I explain it, it's not even funny. <laughs> it, it means, are you prepared for this? Basically. Um, because of, <laughs> sometimes I just think she must be like, wow. But, it, <laughs> but we've got to have somewhere to put these feelings. And actually therapy, if you can access it, is is so valuable. It really is. 
So talk yeah. to me a little bit about the, the aftermath because um, I also want to know how your mum is. Oh, yes. Thank you for asking. She is doing well. Um, she does have to have, you know, like checkups every three months, but she's not doing any chemo anymore, no treatments, and she is feeling good. So that's um, one blessing. That's a, um, that's a huge relief and yeah, a blessing, like you say. And did you find that your mum, I mean, obviously she was she was going through her own um, health concerns at the time, but do, did you find that having been a widow herself, that she was able to offer you uh, an, a greater level of understanding and support? That's a tricky you don't topic. Know. Okay. I I can I can share um, because it can be helpful to someone else as well. Um, uh, I felt, especially in the first well year, I'd say, but first six months, that I could hardly speak to my mom because I. First of all, I was angry, not at her or, or at me or just angry because of the situation that sort of I blamed for everything. Like if that hadn't happened, then this wouldn't have happened and so on. Second of all, my mom, whenever she called me, she cried so much, so much. And I felt that I had to protect her. So I know that she was the person who could understand me most in the world. And since I was Andre, I had even more respect for her. You know how she handled everything and without any grief education, any grief support, any grief group, any friends who were grief literate, you know, I just, I just, really don't know how she did it that's made me go all goosebumpy because i i agree and knowing now how awful grieving is even with you know access to the internet books podcasts uh even then it, it's like navigating without a map right and back then you know unless there was a sort of local church that offered a bereavement group there was nothing you were just expected to kind of put your big girl pants on and and get on with it but I also can exactly. un understand this you know, for your mum to watch you going through something that she un she'd been through herself. I imagine that a lot of her grief came out, grief that she wasn't necessarily able to express back then. Um, and I also understand this kind of feeling of needing to support other people whilst you're in so much pain yourself and it can cause you to step back. I, I had a friend um, who called me and just howled down the phone at me and I just hung up on her. Because I was like, I, I can't, I, if I can make a coherent sentence, you can do that for me, right? Um, but it's 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 very complicated grief. And I can only imagine how much your mum will have had to push down back in, I'm not going to work out what decade, but, you know, and then to have to, and then to see you going through it, it must have been really painful. And one of the things my dad said to me, um, which really kind of seems like it should have been me, I should, it should have been me, I would swap with him. And it's that, they can't protect you. you. You can't protect your baby. And that must, you know, even your 40 odd year old baby, you still their baby, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what so I... tell me. No, I was just going to ask what um what bereavement support was available to you in, in Spain because did you know, did your friends kind of rally round and did you get your because I speak to some people and they have like meals dropped off on the doorstep and things like this. And did you find a lot of comfort uh, comfort? Um did you find that people rallied around basically? Yes. I mean I'm so grateful for the support I had, even though I did not necessarily feel it that much when I was going through it because I just felt so alone. I just felt that nobody could understand. But my friends were great. Friends who were actually here and friends from abroad, you know, like people who couldn't be with me physically, let's say. They, they sent messages. They, they, sent, they showed, you know, their support. Actually, I have a friend living in Vienna who in the first couple of weeks, she sent me like audio messages, half an hour, one hour long. <laughs> 
And I would listen to these messages before I discovered the world of podcasts. And, and, and I, I listened to these messages during the night when I couldn't sleep and they would calm me down, you know. And um, yeah, people brought food. People helped me with paperwork. Uh, people helped me organize the funeral uh, because everything happened so fast and we had to bring Andres' body from, from you know, uh, that town where he died to Barcelona. And, and I just didn't have the capacity to, I mean, I didn't know how these things worked and, and you're in, in a, I mean, I've been here for a, for a long time, but, you know, it's still, you're, you're in a, not in your country. So it's, it's, it's different. And, and uh, friends uh, took a dog to to be with them because obviously I couldn't walk the dog three times a day and, and he is a big dog. Actually, another, like, you know, people talk about secondary losses and, and, and things like that. I had to basically find home for, for all the three animals because I, I moved twice since Andre died. I even don't know how I did that. You know, like moving the house is one of the st most stressful events right. on the, you know, like list of stressful events. So, yeah, but luckily the three of them have really, um, are with special people and I still can see them, you know, the animals, the, the dog and the cat. So, but and there was a, a, a big problem with the cat, like, like health problem, but now she's okay. You know, like all these things. My cat died. I'm, I'm rambling on. Sorry, I'm not making much sense. I'm mixing You're not topics. Cool. But yeah, you asked me about the the support and the, and the resources. Yes, friends were really helpful. Some people appeared out of nowhere. Some people that I didn't hear from for a long time. They started, you know, sending messages, and we sort of mm, became closer now. Some people disappeared. And that happens and that hurts. That hurts a lot. I actually have a friend. And you know, when you're grieving and especially in the first months, you're so sensitive and you're so selfish as well. Yeah. It's like you, you don't want people to tell you how you will feel better or how they understand. Because I actually felt that nobody understood, that they really couldn't understand. And I was talking to a friend whom I was quite close to. And... She said, you know, we all grieve something. <sighs> wow. And, and we hardly ever talk now. I mean, she stopped sending messages. She stopped calling. And I just cannot bring myself. You don't need it. To call her or to explain why that hurt. I mean, I did tell her at that point and maybe she was offended but I said you know that comet just felt so minimizing and I do know that we all grieve something in fact I grieved for something for I was gonna say whole life you know I was gonna say nine-year-old lost her dad like you, you you are familiar with the concept of grief I think people can and I, I almost feel sorry for people sometimes because they don't know what to say but I don't think that ex excuses the insane levels of insensitivity that you receive as a widow and and we can be quite reactive like I've behaved in ways oh, I'm not proud of and I'll, uh, you know Ben will have been gone six years next week and over that six years particularly in the early stages I've behaved out of character I've said things done things crazy shit right and <laughs> and I've lost friends along the way not because I've been horrible but because they maybe haven't approved of the way I've acted or some people really couldn't get around the head around the fact that I remarried. Um, I don't know whether they felt that I think there's an element of um, well, nobody wants to be forgotten. And so they sort of, it's, um, I don't know, it, it's almost quite a, oh, I couldn't bear it if my partner remarried, perhaps, I don't know. And I also think that we change, you know, beyond all recognition almost. I, I think of myself, although I was 37, I think of myself as a child. You know, I, I was so unworldly in terms of you know, talking about not knowing how to pay the gas bill too. And I've had to learn very quickly, as I imagine you have. Uh, we talk about the complexities of getting his body brought back. And oh my God, there's a lot of admin when somebody dies, right? It's the paperwork. Wow. And you're trying to do this at a time when your entire world has been blown apart. So your cognitive ability is probably not at its best. And actually, you mentioned <laughs> earlier about reading. I can, I've just started reading in... 
I, 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 one of my only superpowers is I read really fast. So I read a book a day. And um, now I've got back into reading. I go to the, I've got, there's a charity shop on my road and I just go in there and just buy these books for kind of 30p a book. And they're just like stacking up in my house. And um, now it's come back. So I sort of want to give you hope that the love of reading will come back because it, and it's quite a common phenomenon. No, I couldn't watch TV, couldn't concentrate on a book and I lost myself in my phone. And that's why it's nice that your friends were leaving you these messages because it's your phone, you, the phones, they, they give and they take in equal measure. But I think being able to access support from a little g gadget in your hand actually makes you feel much less alone than you, you perhaps would be at three o'clock in the morning. Yes, exactly. And another friend, since the day Andre died until today, she has sent me messages every single day. Wow. And there's a friend of a friend whom I had only met like a couple of times at some parties. She so stepped up for me. Like now we're really close. You know, some people go, but some people appear. And in general, I must say, I've had really a lot of support, especially, you know, like... Uh, I also started therapy very, very early and friends suggested, you know, like where I can, you know, suggested therapists and so on. I joined the grief group. <clears throat> so that that was really helpful as well. And grief group, I do have loads of friends who support me, but grief group is a space where, you know, yeah, like people do understand you on a I have a whatsapp group on my phone level. and it's um and, and it has changed people have left people have joined because it's it's been running for nearly six years now and we we don't get to see each other that often we're scattered around the UK but when we when we when we when we can do we do and and quite a lot of them came to my second wedding to my wedding to John and it's you can be that kind of ugly angry raging against the world that kind of what you described where you're just so angry and you're not angry at anybody in particular you're just angry and those people get it they don't think oh my god she's having a meltdown you know we need to do we need to refer her to psychiatric care it's they get that you've just sometimes you've got to say that shit out loud and then it it, it calms and nobody understands us like other widows that's that is the the the, uh, the truth of yeah. it yeah 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 and I must say, even within the grief group, when I joined, I joined very early. There was nobody who lost uh, their husband or partner suddenly. So I was at that point. And again, people who have been through this will understand, even though it sounds horrible to somebody who hasn't. Like, I would say I envied I the other people who got the chance to say goodbye I knew that you were going to say that because partners and husbands, even though it's so horrible to watch a person you love be ill, and you know, and and if I think of Andre, who was so full of, I mean, he would have hated that. I know that you know, if we had to choose or got to choose our own death, I mean, he wouldn't have chosen that moment for sure. But you know, the way <laughs> it was, the way he lived, you know, and he died flying. You know, do you know what? But still. This, Tell me. So, sorry, just it's again, this is kind of freaky how similar we are actually, because I've had the same discussions and a, a, a good friend, she was actually my very best friend at primary school and we stayed in touch. Um, her husband was diagnosed with terminal cancer before Ben died. And I, when he died, I can remember that feeling of going, well, at least she will get to say goodbye. And I know John's wife died of cancer. So I, I know much more than I did previously about how awful it is to watch the deterioration of the person you love. Um, but it is the trade-off. You either get to say goodbye or they go out in a blaze of glory. And like and Andre, I think Ben would have, like, if he died in a car accident, I would have scattered his ashes at sea because that's where he felt. That was the second, his second favorite place to be. His first was with me and the kids. The second was in the water. So, yes, if we could have maybe added on another 40 years before it mm -hmm. happened, but he went doing something he loved. He didn't go out with his dignity being stripped from him in a hospital bed. And weirdly, as time goes on, that gives me some, some a little chink of comfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So I was just going to really ask you what life looks for you now, because it's still relatively early days for you. It's 18 months-ish. And um, I don't know about you, but I found the second year, I used to refer to it as the year that no one gives a shit. Because it's like you've done all the firsts and now it's like, right, off you go, crack on. True. Um, in terms of these intense feelings and like in the first year or especially the first six months I was just so terrified that this is what I would feel for the rest of my life and I was just trying to get to the other side of it so I was trying to learn everything about grief and that gave me some sort of purpose you know yeah and also yeah like honor all these firsts that were so difficult and then and then you would think, okay, I've done my work, so get me my reward. <laughs> it's like getting to that mountain. I used to describe it as like being a Sherpa and having to drag the kids up this mountain, just wanting to get to the top yeah. so that I could look it back and take the view. And I, I imagine it was on Instagram or something, and I saw something the other day, and it's like, why do we only think there's one mountain? And it's so true because you go up and then you come down and it's nice and easy and then something comes. And grief is a bit like that. It, it, I, For example, on the fifth anniversary, I was... I almost kind of um, comatose with grief. I was just staring at a wall. I couldn't even articulate it. It just landed on my chest and it took me back. I felt like I was back there in that moment. Whereas the year before, I don't, I don't not that it was easy, but it, I thought, oh, okay, this is all right. It's starting to be less agonizing, but it's a, it's a funny old beast. It, it will land on you when you don't expect it. And it's not always on the significant dates either. That's what I really find strange. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, the second year, uh, quite difficult, more lonely, I'd say, more lonely, like you said, because people sort of assume that you are okay. And also they have their own lives, oh, obviously. Yes. And, and a lot of the things that Andre and I did as a couple, let's say, uh, with other couples and families, even if I joined them somehow, I feel lonely. Yeah. So, and some people stopped inviting me and, and I do meet other people more, let's say, but right now, uh, my life obviously doesn't look like what I wanted it to look like. I'm still very much grieving for the future we should have had and for the present. I do take him everywhere I go. Is that I feel like he's with me. I was going to say literally with his ashes or metaphorically? Metaphorically. <laughs> <laughs> metaphorically. Uh, I'm not, I stopped doing some of the activities that I did before because I'm just, I did a lot of therapy, a lot of healing, uh, grief group. So basically I got back to work. So basically now I'm trying to establish a new routine that would give me some sort of, let's say, um, joy. Mm -hmm. No, there's not joy. A funny word. I know. You're grieving, but you know, there, I must admit it does exist. But the first time I realized that, you know, like, wow, this is so amazing. I'm having such an amazing time. But this feeling underneath this 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 deep sadness and to just realize and to accept that it will always be there I was just so angry yeah. I was just so angry so what do you mean I can't outrun this what do you mean I can't squash it with well, I mean whatever coping mechanism I tried booze drugs running you name it I tried it but you cannot outrun it and I think you're so right when you ask the realization that it's not going to go anywhere but that you can coexist with it and that this this grief will it will never go but it will become just a part of who you are but it doesn't have to twist you that's what I thought I thought I was just going to be angry and and actually scared because when we talked about not worrying when our husbands hadn't come home that weird phenomenon now if I can't get hold of anybody I go immediately to worst case scenario and they're dead they and 
that I think is something that EMDR might be able to help me with because it leads me to live my life waiting for that shoe to drop, waiting for something else to happen that's going to, you know, a catastrophe. And, you know, you and I both know that bad things will happen. Nobody goes through life unscathed. Right. But it's worrying about it and waiting for it isn't going to stop it happening because I wasn't expecting that to happen and it happened anyway, right? But it's, yeah. it is to have that catastrophic divide between then and now I find it just means I don't ever, you can be thinking, basically the last, the day before Ben died, I said to my mum, I just can't believe how perfect my life is. I can't believe I it, and I ended up here that it turned out like this. So now anytime I'm yeah. thinking that I'm like, but, and, and it, oh my, oh. yeah. You know, one of the last, I sometimes go through the messages that Andre and I sent to one another and like two days before he died, when he was at work, he sent me a message to check up on me, you know, like, how are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I'm sort of feeling down, but I'm just so happy to have you in my life. Oh, I'm so glad that I told him that, you know, I, I exactly, and that I can see that, that I can see the message because sometimes I doubt everything. Sometimes I, I think, what if he wasn't as happy with me as I was with him, you know, like... What if I didn't show him the way he showed me how much he loved me, you know? Yeah. And actually I had and, a, and I, I used the term, I had a friend say to me, yeah, I was looking back through the messages that you sent me and loads of them were just slagging off Ben. And I was like, hey, why did you tell me that? And be, yeah. of course, I, I've been with him for 14 years. Like we all moan about our spouses. And I thought, oh no, is that what people think? And I, and like you, I am so glad that he knew how much I loved him. It was Mother's Day the day before he died, and he wasn't one for Mother's Day. You know, he would say, well, "I'm not, you're not my mother." But he had, um, we'd gone out to a farm with the children, and then we'd gone for a meal, and it was really busy in the restaurant. And the waitress was just so nice. And actually, I saw her um, a few months later, and she said she'd gone home that day, and be like, "I've just met the most lovely family," and then bang. But Again, it's that kind of blessing and a curse because you had so much joy and happiness, but at least you knew you had it rather than looking back with, oh, why didn't I appreciate him more? Why didn't I tell him I loved him? We told each other we loved each other every day. That was just who we were. We weren't particularly soppy or demonstrative, but, you know, I love you was, was, a, was a phrase that we use. And my last words to him, which I do remember, were, be safe, darling. I, I write, oh, and, but then, yeah. but now if I say it to anybody, you know, I'll be safe. To, I have to stop myself because I now think that I can, I can create death. You know, the, I somehow think I've got this much power, which obviously I don't. Oh my God, Rosie! Because <laughs> just this morning, before before uh, we we started recording, my sister sent me sent me a message. My sister has been so supportive. Uh, um. She sent me a message like, uh, you know, for the Women's Day and so on. And she said, like, you are such a beautiful and, I don't know, amazing woman. I love you. And I said, I love you. And then I said, I'm so happy to have you in my life. And as soon as I sent it, I was like, <gasps> because, you know, that was sort of similar. Yeah, I do what I said to Andre and I was like oh my god oh my god oh my god and then I was like calm down calm down calm down it was actually breathe, my mum said to know? me she's like um the entire world does not revolve around you this is not the universe plotting to get you it's a tragedy yeah. I was like, oh. <laughs> oh. I don't know how I feel about that yeah we're not we're not that important no, it appears oh, not it appears not. not that important <laughs> can I also say that I would like to echo the words that your sister messaged you today I think that your sister is very wise and I think anybody that's listening to this podcast will um agree entirely that you are a, a, a really beautiful human being and you talk so uh, lovingly and eloquently about Andre and I I, it ne I will never stop being horrified and shocked by the level of pain that humans can endure and then still be good human beings afterwards. And I think that every episode that we record is a testament to human strength and to hope, which is something that we so desperately need, um, it is the idea that, yes, it's awful and, yes, it's really, really scary, but in a, within 18 months you could be you know in a position where you're able to tell your story like you have and I'm not saying this is the end of your grief journey by any stretch of the imagination you know that but I think that 
being in a position where you are able to tell your story and talk about your love and how much it impacted on you I think there's an enormous power in that and I'm really proud of you to, for taking the chance to do it thank you so much and I just wanted to say another thing mm -hmm. like just to mention the support I've had, I've also had support from Andres' parents you know, and his sister, I'm, I just, his family. I meant to ask about them because, because they're, you know, they're so far away. Yeah, that was terrible. First, you know, like we wanted them to come to the wedding. They wanted to come to the wedding. But, you know, it was it's a long way. And we said, you know, and, and their health is not the best. And we said, oh, don't worry. You'll come at another time when we can dedicate also more time to you and we can really do stuff because you know what weddings are like, yes. you know, like, so just, uh, so they didn't come. And then, of course, he died. So suddenly also they didn't come. They couldn't come because everything happened so fast and unexpectedly. And, and, and the phone call I had to make, it's like, I don't really remember it, but. I think I called his sister and just to say that they have been so supportive and they really like extend their love to me so that I sort of feel and there's love through them as well while they're grieving, you know, I mean, how terrible it, it is for them, oh, no, but no. they, you know, they're also such, I don't know, you can tell that Andre is theirs I was because gonna... they're, they're also so loving and, and, and well, it's generous. It's actually Mother's, Mother's Day on Sunday in the UK. And uh, I always send Ben's mum a card. And uh, I actually wrote in her card today, um, not today, so when I posted it, um, I can't get quoted verbatim, but it was something like, um, you know, thank you for raising one of the greatest humans I ever met and for the legacy that he's left behind. And I also put and thank you for treating me like one of your own because Ben was one of six. So there's, he, his mother had six children and, um, and actually she's a widow as well. Her husband died on the same day as Ben, but five years prior, which is just, yeah. And much like you, the love that has been poured into me and my kids by her. We don't see a huge amount, which is at the Isle of Wight, which is across a small body of water. So not quite the distance to Brazil, but it's, <laughs> we, we're in, and she, even things like Holly, um, John's daughter, she remembers her birthday, includes her in Christmas presents. And it's, 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 I know not everybody has that relationship with their in-laws and, and death doesn't necessarily bring you closer, but I think in uh, my instance, it has. And I, I love her very much and she loves me and she loves the children and you're right that way that little part of them continues to exist and she can tell me stories and she can tell the children's stories about when he was little um and actually when you said about you learning um to speak the same language as your mum uh Ben grew up in Wales and he learned Welsh so that the old ladies would give him sweets <laughs> so <living well. laughs> yeah and I'm actually planning to visit them in in November are you wonderful yeah I think it's a necessary I'm going next week thing to do I mean I feel we need to see one another and to yeah yeah because they will be the only people oh, in the world yeah. that experience a grief of the same magnitude right it's there is nobody else in the world that will be hurting as much and will know him as well as you guys. So to be together and and I'm so I'm, I've taken the children out of school for two days next week and we're going to go to the Isle of Wight and I've booked a little Airbnb on the beach. Um, which although he didn't die near there, it, it is where I feel closest to him. So we'll you know we'll probably right. draw on some pebbles or something or we might not. I think you you have to let the day guide you a bit, and I'm cautious particularly of my elder son of enforced grief you know of going well today's the day your dad died you must feel sad today it you can't it has to come when it comes but I'm, work like that. I'm quite jealous that you're going to Brazil that sounds really um I wish it was for a nicer reason <laughs> well yeah we did go we did luckily we did go and then I went in just before the lockdown in fact and we spent some time with his family there so that was nice and actually when you were asking about what my life uh, looked like now basically I try to I I have decided from this year on to to like um, 
plan a little trip each month because I love I, I love traveling. Uh, Andre and I both loved traveling. Uh, we traveled quite a lot. Of course, last year it was, I couldn't imagine even a planning a trip. Um, but yeah, I'm going to spend some time with my family next month. Then in May, I'm going to visit a friend. And then I'm going in June. I mean, I have a, a, a small trip planned every month. And that's something I look forward to let's say yeah. and i'm going to meet a fellow widow <laughs> is that the right word yeah. whom i met on an online um grief thing and we started talking and she has also a similar story to mine her her husband died two months after they got married and i'll go um, and, that? and i'll meet her on that trip as well and where's this where? Yeah. In uh, in Sweden. Oh. Well, you know, London is not that far away, and I am not that far from London, and you may be aware that there is a festival happening in next uh, this year in, in August. So if you ever feel the need to come to the UK, you let me know, and I will, at the very least, take you out for a, a mocktail or a coffee, because <laughs> there is something so powerful about meeting up with people that I've interviewed through a screen, and even in the summer, I was able to meet up with some people in America, and it, it's yeah, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like that feeling of connection. But I have a feeling that you and I will stay in touch anyway because I I really like you. Um, I think you're um <laughs> I think you're very special, and I am incredibly sorry that you found yourself in this really shitty club that no one wants to be in. But I'm pleased that you you found us, and I'm I'm pleased that you are in a position now where you can talk about it and I wish you nothing but happiness and I hope that you grab onto these adventures and and I, I look in fact we must maybe uh Facebook friends or something so I can see with you your adventures as you go because I'll, I'll live vicariously through you because traveling with four kids is oh, less less uh, <laughs> less easy yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> but for now my darling you take care of yourself and thank you so much for for sharing your story um it's going to be incredibly valuable to people and it was an honor to, to hear it so thank you thank you so much thank you and I do hope we stay in touch thank you for everything and uh, yes I do hope that my story can also help without someone doubt. like their stories helped me and for anybody that has been listening and has been affected by today's episode please do get in touch you know um where to find me it's instagram widowed as what af or you can go onto the website uh, www.widowedaf.com but for now you guys take care out there lots of love just before you go Xenia did actually send us a little extra recording that she wanted to share with you all so please welcome back Xenia. and you know um an important Part of my life nowadays is uh, the daily practice of yoga. I say daily, but it's, I don't manage to do it every day. But it is an important part of my self-care routine, shall we say. And it took me months to be able to get back to it after the accident. Um, because, you know... To do yoga you need to be in the present moment it really grounds you and i didn't want to be in the present moment my mind kept going back to the present where the life i loved was or rushing to the future that i didn't want and and that i imagined to be full of suffering and and pain and misery so being able to stay in the present for at least a while during uh, the day was very important. And, you know, I, I started by just sitting on the mat and crying. And then slowly, day by day, I mean, it, be, it became easier to, to stay focused and, and to do the practice. Um, on some days it's still very difficult and I still cry and I can't manage to do the meditation or the breathing exercise or, you know, but it's also important to, to have this activity that I can do on my own at, at home, 
at any time of day and uh, it doesn't depend on any outside circumstance and it's always there for me and I would really recommend it to anyone. Also, it's uh, an activity Andre and I did together in the lockdown. <laughs> and uh, those are nice memories. Um, it was good to, to show him something that he didn't n normally do. Uh, he was so good at so many things and I learned so much from him. Um, he loved um, doing everything around the house. He loved cooking, he loved uh, gardening, he could fix anything from a sock to the washing machine. <laughs> uh, and he was interested in so many things and um, so it, he was also like very uh, open to to doing yoga and um, moving forward to use this expression I just want to honor him and everything that he gave me in the four years and nine months that we got to spend together not nearly enough and not nearly close to the 120 years that we uh, promised to one another but you know, uh, we shared such an amazing love story, um, such beautiful connection. And um, he taught me so much, not just me, I think that he taught me and everybody he crossed paths with uh, how to be present, how to be there for another person, how to show people that you care. And uh, and also, <laughs> he could make you laugh. Oh wow! I can hear his loud laughter in my in my head. So I want to honor that. I am so grateful for having had this beautiful man <laughs> in my life, and I will miss him always and I will carry him with me always so I want to thank you again for for letting me tell you about him about us and thank you for letting me share my experience in this journey that nobody wants to be on and yeah, just thank you.